to a year into this thing. <laughs> let's thank God. <laughs> let's thank God for the gift of learning Torah together. Baruch Ata Adonai Wes, it will be great. I, I may I suggest it will be great to have the translation next to you. I have no idea what I've been saying for <laughs> 58 weeks. I read these blessings, have no idea what they mean. It means, God, thank you for the gift of learning Torah together, and thank you for the gift of, of joining us uh, on this. Uh, <laughs> On this Shabbat, it's snowing outside, but it's warm and cozy inside, and we're delighted to be with you. We have a very important topic to talk about, and, and it, it's a, a really cosmic karma confluence of how this topic is teed up this morning between uh, a conversation I had with a, a class that I was teaching on Zoom and literally uh, Rabbi Sachs's commentary on our portion this morning, which is Tetzaveh. And they're just exactly aligned. Uh, uh, and it's from the first verse of the Torah portion, which maps onto our reality. So here's the deal. Um, I, this is one of the Chavaraz that I teach every year. And I always begin the class. Uh, you know, it's always been at somebody's home. This year, of course, it was on Zoom. And I always begin with a check-in because it's an annual conversation. I've been with this group for 24 years. And how you doing? What's going on? And every year, it's an opportunity to kind of catch up on life. Uh, my son got married. My daughter got married. We have a new grandchild. I'm retiring. Uh, we just came back from three months from here. We're going to two months from there. Um, life stuff. Something really interesting at work or something that my kid is doing is really interesting at work. There's energy and there's news and there's life. And this year... Uh, admittedly, it was on Zoom, so it was obviously different. When I went around, the first person did all of us such a big service. I said, how are you? And she said, how am I? Do you mean, how am I really? And I said, yeah, 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 how are you really? And then she said, well, to be honest with you, for the first time in my life, I am working through low-grade depression. And when she said that, uh, you could just kind of feel the relief and the release on the screen, on the Zoom call. And then every person thereafter shared that they were battling some form of low-grade, you know, pandemic depression. Um, so first thing I want to do is ask my dear colleagues, are you seeing this? Are you hearing this? Are you feeling this? Low, you know, we're approaching the one-year uh, mark. Uh, are, are you seeing this, hearing this, feeling this? And then we'll and, and talk about that. Um, and, then, and then we'll bring the Torah to bear. Uh, yeah, thanks, Lies. By all means. Yes.
So nobody heard what I said about the $12 Entonces million. Dollars. Oh my God. Well, just to sum up, you know, Rabbi Gardenshorts and I have now a connection because he endows my chair, my contorial chair for $12 million. So now we all dressed up in the same yes. way. There is a spiritual connection. Anyways, um, so in terms of the your question, uh, and open up my heart right away, um, there has been some low points for me in this pandemic. But honestly, um, the hardest thing that I experienced in my life was living in Argentina. There's nothing that can top that. And after two or three years that I was here in America, everything sank. You know, when the when the pushki, you, you the, drop the, the, the coin. And uh, I was wondering, I was depressed. I was wondering why did I come? Why did I leave my family, my friends, my language, my city, everything? Things were not working well here for me. Uh, so nothing can top that feeling that I had in those moments. And for me, it has been many silver linings in the pandemic. Just to give an example to everybody, all of us before the pandemic were here working so many hours, all right? On a Wednesday morning, typical Wednesday morning, I would come to Minyan, my kids will be sleeping. I will come back in the middle of the day to have lunch, my kids will be at school. Then I will come teach six, seven bar mitzvah students, stay for choir, and go back home and my kids will be sleeping. That is gone now with the pandemic. With the Zoom, we have the ability of teaching from home. So that's a huge silver lining for me. Mm -hmm. To do a bar mitzvah lesson, falling asleep, or my ears are hurting, and then my boys come and give me a hug, and I'm ready for the next one. So, you know. Wow. Thank you, Elias. Michelle. Uh, so I'm in Elias's chair. So I <laughs> thought. <laughs> So, I, you know, I thought I'd start with the power and the importance of Makom Kavua and how shaken we really are from that sense. So on the, on the downside, the Makom Kavua piece means that I am profoundly uncomfortable right here in this spot. But you left me such a nice warm chair, Elias. <laughs> You've been hiding the secret this entire call me, time. Call me Lord, Lord Nesson here. The entire time he has been guarding that he has the warmest chair in this room. Um, but actually, I think in the <laughs> to the question of the, the low-grade depression, I mean, I actually think it really does have to do with that sense of makom kavua. I mean, all of us have been shaken from our makom kavua in the world. What we thought we were Would you just translate makom kavua? Makom kavua is the place where you sit. And there is, you know, sort of this great Jewish connection that, you know, people would come into a room at shul, um, and would say, you know, there could be 500 seats empty, and there's one seat that somebody has sat in, and they come over and say, excuse me, you're in my chair. And um, I actually think in some ways the pandemic has... <laughs> I just want to say, I did not instigate the, sweet, the seat switching. I just want to be really clear We're that was trying not my something idea. new, because, okay. by the way, guys, okay, so... <laughs> We're trying something new. It's okay. We can all roll with it. But the pandemic has actually aggravated all of our sense of makom kavua. We thought we knew who we were, where we were going, what we were doing, what our plans, that we had some level of control over our lives. You were going to be two months here, three months there. We were going to know where we were sitting in our office and what our plans were for any given meeting. And now here we are. And we don't know what's happening tomorrow. And there's a sense in which all of us have been so profoundly dislocated and, and even reaching for a sense of like, what kind of control can I have in this world puts us on our, on our backs, you know, puts us in a place where we're very destabilized and leads right. to that low grade depression. Now on the plus side, and I'm hoping it's working for this class today, there's another teaching, which is Mishane Makom Mishane Mazal, when you, <laughs> when you change your you see, spot, I'm changing your luck. when you change your spot, you change your luck in, in the world. And God willing, the pandemic has also taught us that in facing this low grade depression, we have right. the opportunity to then work on it, shift it, change it, and, and hopefully get into the real. Yeah. I, before, uh, Aliza, you speak, I wanted to just comment, Michelle, on one of your points to tease that out, which is one of the things that is dislocating 
uh, is is not only that we've lost control, but we've lost control for how long we've lost control. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, there's a, I think any of us, if we knew that there's a date certain by which we've lost control, but we're going to get our control back on April one, we could deal with it. But we've lost control, and we've lost control over how long we've lost control. So just to give you a just a whip, you know, a whiplash example, which is so current, you know, Thursday was Purim. Thursday night was Purim, and of course, uh, it's usually a place that's filled with families and kids. And it was, it was the five of us uh, in the Rabbi Chill Sanctuary. Um, and uh, but we had gone into Purim with a little uh, glide in our stride. Um, and a little more energy, even though it was, it was quiet, because Governor Baker had announced the relaxation of, uh, you know, st- of, of the strict standards and the opening. And so all of us were able to entertain a fantasy. What would this mean to Temple Emanuel? Would we be able to see our friends, our members, the members of Temple Emanuel, maybe masked, distanced, all that good stuff, atten- you know, with attestations and sanitizer and all that good stuff, but maybe people again. And, and that actually gave us a huge lift. And only then on Friday... You know, when we heard from our, our leader here, uh, the, you know, Rochelle Walensky, our beloved friend and, and teacher, the head of the CDC, uh, who said, yes, we are done with the virus, but the virus is not done with us. And it's very tenuous. And so, again, lack, you, have, you have optimism and hopefulness and maybe we can change. And then there's variants and there's mutations and there's this, right? So I, I think it's a lack of control over the lack of control and the indefiniteness of it all that exacerbates. Yeah, and, and the weather is the perfect example. Yesterday was so nice. Yeah. All the snow <laughs> melted. Oh, spring is coming. Boom! We wake snow. up this morning. I remember vividly, and, and Alisa, we will give you an opportunity for you to talk, even though you, st- <laughs> even though you stole one of the chairs, you know, Macomb Kavua. I did not steal a chair. It was all my idea, by the way. I remember vividly with the five of us were having a staff meeting in March last year, still in person, and you said vividly, I remember vividly, my wife told me we are going to be on this for a year. And I thought, this guy is delusional. This guy is completely delusional. He's exaggerating. And you were right. And As usual, uh, Shira was right. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, Aliza. So I want to just circle into that locus of control and lack of control because I think, you know, I don't think any of us would have chose this off of the menu of life. And when I think back to our ancestors, like most people in the history of humanity have felt less control. And their lives have been not as much, like they they knew they couldn't plant, right? Like they would plant crops and they just had to wait and hope that God would provide rain enough for their crops to grow. And they would plan their lives and they didn't have the kind of medical interventions that we have. And so this was a much more common experience. And so part of me wonders how we can use this lack of control to grow because there are places in which when we feel like we should have control, uh, it causes pain and angst. And I, there's a silly example, right? Like I remember like starting at 18, I was like, okay, I will now meet the, my future husband, the love of my life now. And for At 18? At 18. At Cherry Creek High School? At Cherry Creek High School, yes. And How did that work out? Not great. <laughs> <laughs> Dating pool is not great. <laughs> and like... The thought that, like, you know, all the self-help books and all the guides that are like, you are in control of your destiny, and if you haven't met your person, if you haven't gotten this, it's because you're, you're inner, you're not thinking positively enough, you're not doing enough, you're not being enough. And so I was like, I was on all the dating apps, I was doing everything that I could possibly do. It didn't change anything. It turns out, like, 10 years of that, and then I met Solomon, but, like, that could not have happened. Like there's, there's a universes in which things just don't happen. And, and I think that when we operate, when we think we're living in a world where we have control and where we have that, that hubris that I, I control my environment, I control my world, I am in control, that actually causes us additional pain. And if we can come out of this, and I think part of that, right, in Buddhism, they talk about um, the life is suffering. And suffering is created by attraction, like that you have these ideas about what you want, and when you don't get what you want, you suffer. And so how do we reduce suffering? We reduce suffering by being okay with what we've got. And so I, you know, I hope we're going to get out of this and get back to being together. I think a real important lesson for all of us is how do we uh, 
accommodate ourselves? How do we adjust to being okay not being in control and not feeling like that's a depressing thing? It's not a depressing thing. It's just true. We're not in control. So let me take that comment about lack of control and trying to work ourselves into being okay with being in, uh, not in control and pivot to Rabbi Sachs, okay? Uh, and this is just, and, and I'm gonna, for, for getting up at 8.30, I'm going to give you two words in Hebrew that I've been saying all week that come from the first verse in our Torah reading and that is the basis for Rabbi Sachs' commentary. Makom Kavua. No, not <laughs> Makom Kavua. So um, the portion begins with uh, the instructions for lighting the menorah. And it talks about you have to light the menorah with olive oil. Okay. And so the phrase, here's five Hebrew words, of which the most important are the last two. Shemen zayit, which is olive oil. Zach, which is pure or clear, so clear olive oil. And then katit lamaor. So katit comes from the Hebrew shoresh. You know, Hebrew root is three letters, so it's kaf, tough, and tough. So if you look up kaf, tough and tough in the concordance. That shorish means to beat or to crush. So katit means beaten, crushed. And the phrase is katit lama or crushed for the light. And the title, so what we need is olive oil that's clear and pure and is crushed for the light. So the verse in the portion, the first one in Tetzaveh, connects crushedness with light. And Rabbi Sachs' commentary is called Crushed for the Light. The two words I want you to hold on to are katit lam or. Now, here's what he does, and, and there's a meta lesson beyond what he, he writes. He tells the story of, uh, just if you haven't read it, Henry Noble, who is um, a Jew who's born in Hitler's Europe, and he has to leave in 1932, and he he moves to England and he's very successful and he becomes a business person and a communal leader and he's got it going on and he's, he's, he's got children and he's got grandchildren and he's got money and he's got a gorgeous apartment in the right part of town and he's in what we might call the harvest years. The harvest years. He's, he's earned it. He's worked. He's escaped Hitler. He's built a business. He's, he's had the immigrant experience. Right, he, he went from Germany to England and he created a whole new life. And, uh, and now he's gonna enjoy his children and grandchildren and time and money and, and the Keter Shem Tov, the crown of a good name. And then his wife, Renata, has a stroke and instead of spending those years in the harvest years, he spends those years as a caretaker and goes on, he does that and then he himself gets very sick and his only prayer to God is don't let me die first because I don't want my wife to be alone. Let me die after my wife so that she leaves this world holding my hand. And uh, Rabbi Sachs goes on to say that Judaism does not glorify suffering. Suffering is bad, we hate suffering, we don't want suffering. There's no glory of suffering, but it happens. And then he says, that, and this is just so important, that the question is never why did this happen, because why did this happen? Why did this happen to me? It's just not a helpful question. There's no answer for it. Instead, the question is, now that this happened, what do I do? And that that's a question that can be answered only in deeds. Um, so, colleagues, do you find this posture of Rabbi Sachs, this Henry Noble uh, who's, who's lost control? He had earned harvest years. He had earned nachas years. He had earned, you know, we're going to Jerusalem for a month, we're going to France for a month, and we're gonna be with our grandchildren, we're gonna be at their seventh birthday party, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He had earned that. He was a good person, and he didn't have that. He had a caretaker, and then he died, and she died, or she died, and he died. Um, but what he did was deeds. Is that helpful to this moment? Is that a model that, that you think could be helpful, katit lama or, to the year of our pandemic? So, um, first of all, I want to uh, compliment what Alisa said before. Uh, when I was 18, the last thing that I wanted on earth was to get married. And um, I, wa 
I said, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a singer. I'm going to be a singer. I will have a lot of girlfriends, and I'll have a great time. And you know, maybe when I'm in my 40s, I'll get married. And then, how did that work out for you? And then, <laughs> and then a few years later, I met Lorena, and I, I got married at 27. I remember having a toast with Lorena. Uh, one day, we were coming from a wedding, and I said to her, you know. Just for you to know, I love you, but we are not getting married until I'm 40 or something like that, okay? Two years later, we got married. Anyway, so <laughs> that's how things work in life. Uh, what is, going back to the text and what you are mentioning, Wes, what is remarkable about this gentleman that Rabbi Sachs is describing is that there was a lot of, um, he was very humble. He was very humble, and the text says that, and that when he had success, he said that it's all attributed to God. And in the very t difficult times, he says, what does, what, what does God want from me now? All right? It's really remarkable to think that way in life. I honestly, I don't have that, that faith. You know, I'm sorry to say uh, I'm disappointed you, but I don't have that faith that when, when I'm in the lowest point in my life, what does God want from me? So it's, it's remarkable what he, he was able to do with his life based on his suffering. You know, moving from Germany to, no, Poland to Austria, Austria to London. Uh, and, um, yeah. So, um, Elias, he, when he talked about Henry Noble, he talks about the fact that Henry Noble, I want to get, I want to uh, double click on your point about faith. You don't have that kind of faith, although you admire his faith. Um, let me get at that from a different perspective. Um, he says, Rabbi Sachs of blessed memory says that Henry Noble of blessed memory felt that he had a purpose, a life purpose, that, you know, God saved me from Adolf Hitler for a purpose. Um, and, and, he, and he felt he had this meta narrative, this meta arc, this meta purpose that, that his life was about, and that that infused the good times and also the harder times. It, it, it infused it with an ability for him to control it and, 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 and make peace with it. Do you, when you look at your story, uh, you know, Cantor, uh, the rock star who got married at 27, who became a chazan and a bar mitzvah tutor, uh, uh, do you feel that you have the, like a narrative arc that helps you deal with this pandemic now? Oh, you can be a good uh, shrink. Um, uh, we have to stop now. You're an investor. You're a shrink. You know, you endow chairs. Um, that's a difficult question. I don't know what to to say. I think that when you go in life through hardest times, very hard times, that builds you some, you know, some inner strength that makes you feel a little bit more prepared when hard times come. Um, I'm not so sure I will identify myself like, you know, Mr. Noble, that right. there is a higher purpose, that God wants something from me. That's why I'm a cantor or, uh, you know, as much as I think and I want to get there, mm. no. Michelle or Elisa? I, I was so struck, Wes, when the way you framed the question about how we feel like we've earned this. You know, here you are at the harvest point of your life and you've earned it. And I, I actually think, yeah, that's so real. We all feel like we've earned this. There's something that we deserve here. And, you know, really the story of Henry Noble brings out to me one of, I, I think it's one of the core pieces of the Jewish curriculum, which is n no. <laughs> there, there's actually no such thing as you've earned it. In a sense, if you can see your life, if you can work to see your life as being part of God's will in this world, as being a caretaker, you know, from our very found, most foundational story in the Garden of Eden, right? What are we doing there? We're there to, tin, to tend and to till. We're, it's not ours. It's We are there to work it and to guard it and to help it grow. And if, if somehow we can shift our narrative to, it's not just about me being blessed for me, but it's about me being an instrument 
of God's will in this world, then perhaps that can give us some of the, the strength. Um, if we can keep working against I earned it and more into what's asked for me, it feels like a hugely helpful role, uh, especially uh, I, I read um, in a totally unrelated place that um, there was a philosopher who said that Walt Disney was the most dangerous man in America. Why? Because he gave people stories of happy endings and hope, and that none of us actually live a life of happy endings. Right. So Michelle, can I just, I wanna engage this with you. I think what you say is so true. It was, point one is true that it's just human to feel I've earned it. You know, I've, I've, I've been a good spouse, I've been a good parent, I've been a good worker at my place of employment, I've been good at the community, I've, you know, I've, I've tried to comport myself honorably and with decency, and I'm now X years old, and, and my kids are here, my grandkids are there, I've earned it, and, and, and people feel that. And, and, you know, Lisa, I'm hearing your note uh, from the Eastern traditions of life is suffering and humility and uh, surrender is so important and the lack of controls built into the cosmos is so important. And to connect that, M Michelle, to your point to let go of I've earned it, think about Moses. Who earned crossing the River Jordan and entering the Promised Land more than Moses? So you don't even have to go to the Eastern traditions, you can go to Devorim, you can go to the end of the Torah where Moses dies on the wrong side of the Jordan. That's a nice Jewish text for you didn't earn it. So here's my question though. Uh, you know, as my father-in-law always says, a person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. So I hear the Zen Buddha, and I hear Moses dies on the wrong side of the River Jordan, but God darn it, I feel like I've earned it. And I feel like I'm, get I'm getting screwed. I feel like life is screwing me. I feel like I'm robbed. I feel like I'm robbed, I'm robbed for you. By the way, that was one of the motifs on the Zoom call. I got robbed of a year. So even though I know Zen Buddha is right, and even though I know Moses is, dies on the wrong side, and even though I know I should have humility, I feel like I got screwed by life. What do I do with that? So I, I think that there's some level at which you have to acknowledge that. Like, yes, this isn't what any of us would have signed up for. Um, and yet Elias's point really sinks deeply in my heart about, but what do we have? Right? What, what are the places and the spaces where when our lives turned in that direction, we were forced to expand and grow in ways that were uncomfortable, like sitting in this chair, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but that make us you do things. You said before it was the most comfortable chair. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's getting a little hot. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so that, that actually take us to places that actually are not places we would have gone. And in that way, perhaps we do see the hand of, of God. And if we can ask Henry Noble's question, what's asked of me now with what I have, we take the focus off of, did I earn it? Did I not earn it? Am I suffering or mm. am I not suffering? But okay, he, here I am. Mm. Now what? Thank you. Elisa. So I, I think also... I'm I'm really thinking about this katit lama or that there's something profound that happens for us when when our locus of control is shattered and when we come up against our own powerlessness against the universe and I felt this most poignantly when I was interning at Massachusetts General Hospital in the um, clinical pastoral education program um, and as a as CPE uh, participant uh, I was like on call in the hospital and you'd get paged and you'd go to whatever tragedy was unfolding. And I sat with so many people in the darkest, most intense moment of their life and, and, and on a scale that you just don't see in, in congregational life. Um, and the kinds of conversations that I had with people were just profound. Like there's a way in which the, the, clipot, the, the shells of superficiality and the shells of ego just fall away in those moments and you're able to be more real and I mean we experience this when you're when you're sitting with a family that's that's going through something really tough it it sharpens the focus and it sharpens everyone's ability to be real and to be honest and so I think our challenge is right 
we don't want to live crushed, but we want to live with that ability to get into the core of ourselves and to be real and to be honest and to feel deeply and to connect with one another on that place because right there's that disconnect that happens and I think Wes you you articulated that so beautifully from the group which is when we go into social situations we have a desire to play nice right like to play house like all the you know like little kids with their doll houses and mommy's happy and daddy's happy and all the kids are happy and they're all going through like we want to make everybody feel good and so you say how am I and I'm like great and then how are you really and then once someone is willing to play that first card of vulnerability to play that first card of honesty that creates an environment where everyone can be real and I think that's our question how do we how do we move through this with honesty um and and I think that's that's an noble's question right it's not it's it's processing it's feel I'm sure he felt anger and I'm sure he felt grief and I'm sure he felt um betrayal from the universe for not getting his picture but at the same time he's like okay how do how am i real in this moment right so let me pivot from that i, I want to quote um rabbi Sachs's, you know life-changing idea number 20. when you experience suffering the question to ask is given this has happened what then shall i do for this has an answer not of thought but of deed. So, my question to you, dear colleagues, is, you know, it's a year into the pandemic. You know, Rochelle, w you know, they, actually this was on GMA Today, you know, uh, National News Today, she's quoted today as saying, we're done with the pandemic, the pandemic's not done with us, we're done with the virus, the virus's not done with us, not the time to relax standards, et cetera, which means that we're in this murk indefinitely long. Um, this has an answer not of thought but of deed. What deeds should we do and for what deeds could you advise our congregants who are working their way through situational depression? What deeds could they do can to make this world better? And Eliza and Wait, then uh, can, can, can we make a little more fair conversation here? We never hear your opinion on stuff. So can you tell us how you feel with the whole pandemic, and and then you start by giving an example of a good deed, and then we'll follow you. I, I don't worry, I will. I've got it. I've, I I promise you, I'll get there. Yes. Uh. I just wanted to say we would love it if you wanted to make calls to people in our community. That's a way to model this exactly right. And I say that sort of flippantly, but also in a really deep way. Being willing to sign up to call someone that you don't know. Um, and to have a real conversation and to be open to where they're at and to share where you're at is a profound action that has the potential to help us all to adjust to this lack of control. Um, and we're, we're held up, I know many of you have signed up already to, to join us in this initiative. Um, in order to make it possible, we need more volunteers in order to call everyone. And we don't wanna just call some people, we wanna really call everyone. Um, and so signing up is really critical. Um, so I want to thank you, Elias, because you gave me an opportunity to have life imitate art and art imitate life. It's all here. about the chair. <laughs> it's all about the chair. It's all about the chair um, today because I'm so mindful of how actually physically uncomfortable I am in this space and in this place and that when I walked into a room and that chair was not available to me, I had a choice. I had a choice in that moment. And I could have said, like, this isn't right, and forced my way through, right? And that's one response. I did offer to switch. <laughs> <laughs> or, it's all about or, me, Michelle. Right? It was all it's my all idea. It was all about you. It um, was about gender balance. I was ready to um, switch. Um, <laughs> or, or, right, you could say, wait, maybe I have something to learn in this chair here. And I have to say that through this class, I actually have learned. I've what learned did you learn? a lot. I, first of all, I've learned that Elias's chair forces you to turn your head this way, which makes you feel less connected to the people who we're engaging with who are over there. The view is much um, better from here than yeah. from there. <laughs> you see walls, I see right, but, trees. But I mean, in terms of, I'm, I could spend a long time explaining some of the practical things that I've learned from this experience, but actually I think what I've learned is to confront myself and my own sense of discomfort in a space and to be aware that actually there are some ways in which we become really familiar 
with things and then we hold on to them. And they're as if they are, you know, Torah me Sinai, that we have this particular place and this particular space. And if you take it up on the metaphorical level, they are asking us to take it to, which is the pandemic, you know, I, I think in my life, I was very comfortable with exactly where where I was and where we were as a community with what we were doing. And to, to be forced to confront some of not only the powerlessness, but also the, the discomfort is actually the only way you can grow. And, and I have felt like this year has crushed us. I, I'm an extrovert. And so to be alone in this space has been profoundly difficult. But it has also challenged me and challenged us to find new levels of resilience. Mm. And, and I think when I look at Rabbi Sachs's words, given that this has happened, what shall I do? It takes me to that chair moment. Like I have a choice. I, I don't have a choice about the chair, but I do have a choice about who I will be and what I will learn in this moment. Mm. Elias, and then I promise I will share my thoughts. No, um, it's interesting because over the years I, I heard you saying, uh, giving fabulous sermons, you know. Somebody who donates $12 million always does great <laughs> sermons. <laughs> you never have any flaws. Um, no, but you over and over say, you know, life is not what, we, what happens to us, what do we do about it? And it's exactly what, you know, Rabbi Sachs says here. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely the pandemic has taught us, you know, how to be more flexible with the chairs. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in a serious way, we had to, you know, it's, it's well, I remember through, throughout this pandemic, especially, you know, after high holidays, waking up one morning and telling my wife, you know, you know, every day is the same. I go to the temple and every day is the same. I go to my office and I turn the computer and I sit and I do Zoom. And before that, you know, Shabbat Alive was great with crowds, and the crowds were so different. You know, Shabbat Alive people were different from the Shabbat morning people. And Shabbat morning people with a bar mitzvah was different than without a bar mitzvah. And then we had the religious school, and then we had the nursery school, different crowds. You never can get bored here. And now it's always the same. We wake up, we go to the sanctuary, the sanctuary is empty, we look at each other, sorry about that. But, you know, it's, it's always exactly the same. And, and, and that is difficult, and that forced us to come up with new ideas, to reinvent ourselves, to, to bring our own energy from places that we don't know we have them. Mm. And, uh, and, and I like what you said about the good deeds, about helping others, and making a phone call, and that, perhaps makes a huge difference. So let me um, just say, first of all, thank you guys. And, and I want to offer my, my voice too now. Um, I deeply, deeply love this uh, column, this, this, this commentary by Rabbi Sachs. And more than, I, I love all of his stuff, but this one felt a, a deeper level, and I'll explain why. I felt like there was a meta lesson, a lesson on top of the lesson, in, in his commentary. because What's the commentary about? The commentary is about a man in his 70s who had thought that he had earned a rich, you know, I'll, I'll live until I'm, I'm, I'm 70 something, hope, you know, hopefully I'll live till I'm 90 something and I have another 20 years of nachas. And then he didn't have it. And how Henry Noble uh, dealt with that, indeed, right? But here's the meta lesson. Rabbi Sachs was dying of pancreatic cancer while he was writing this. He himself, the writer who was writing about dealing with, with grace and equanimity and deed, the writer, he wasn't just writing a sermon about somebody else without ever mentioning himself, but we know that that's the meta part. This was his own life story. I mean, it was Henry's story, but it was Jonathan Sachs' story. So here he is. He, he has earned it. He's married... Uh, to his wife, and they have an epic love affair. He has these three kids. He has grandchildren. He has Ket Hashem Tov literally throughout the world, not only the Jewish world, the world, the world. I mean, he's got to be one of the most admired people. Young man in his 70s. Um, and he's been the chief rabbi of England. Um, and somebody that has been in public life for all these years and nobody could say a bad word about. 
and pancreatic cancer. And what's his response? In his last, uh, it's like that book, The Thornbird, who in their, The Thornbird's Last Moments sings like the most beautiful song. The Thornbird sings the most beautiful song with the last strength they have. He writes Morality, uh, which is like the book on our time. And then he writes Judaism's life-changing ideas. And he never talks about himself dying. He doesn't say, I'm dying. He just writes these books. So, he, so to me, it, this is a really important challenge, which is that the most important sermon any of us ever gives and the most important song that any of us ever sings are not the words and not the tune and not the melody. It's our own lives. It's how we live, right? I mean, these books are amazing. But that he wrote these books while he was dying of pancreatic cancer and published them right before he died. I mean, he, he gave a speech, to uh, a Zoom speech to Federation in North America uh, just a month before he died about morality. And there was no hint. He didn't talk about it. There was no, there was no self-reverentialness. He just talked about the ideas in the book. And to me, that is what we're called upon to do now. How is the song that we sing and the sermon that we give uh, elevated by the life that we embody in these times? And, and I want to say the following. I think, I mean, it's obviously down and disconsolate and disconnected and all those things that are obvious. But I, I want to end with a legitimate flip. I think this is by far the most exciting time that I've ever been a rabbi, to be a rabbi. Because literally everything is up for grabs. I mean, folks, the, the old Temple Emanuel that you used to know and love is dead, gone, never coming back. Never coming back. That old world where, where we all come together in person all the time, etc. that just, it's not coming back for anything. Everything is different in this new world. Everything is different in this new world. Um, and the question is, what's going to take its place? And how is it going to be renewed? And how is it going to be revitalized? And how is it going to be stronger than ever? It's going to be more different than ever. But, it's gonna, but, but it can be stronger than ever. How are we going to, you know, it's going to be a world where the, the main word, uh, like the Oxford word of the year, when this is over, is going to be hybrid because we're gonna take, we're gonna figure out how do we take the best of and move it forward uh, with, the, uh, with the best of the pandemic, with the best of the pre-pandemic and create a whole new amalgam. I just think it's the most amazing time. There's such need, there's such need. And together, our clergy team and together with our congregation and together with the lay leadership team, we can create a, a whole synagogue. What will X look like when this is finally over, whenever it will be? That's a question that, what will school look like? What will university look like? What will museums look like? What will symphonies look like? What will your local movie theater look like? What will dining out look like? What will breakfast, lunch, or dinner at a restaurant look like? What will anything look like is entirely different. The old world is gone. This pandemic has changed everything forever. Nothing is it's like, a, it's like, it's like a, a, a comet that came and crushed the earth, speaking of crushed, right? It crushed everything. It crushed the local movie theater and the local restaurant and all those people who used to be entertainers who don't have a job and all the people who used to be restaurant owners who don't have a job and synagogues and churches and mosques. All that's different. And as we emerge from the wreckage, recreation and renewal. And so um, I, to me, it's, it is hard. And it's also, I th I'm thinking of morality and life-changing ideas. I'm thinking of Jonathan Sachs. I'm thinking here's our job. By our job, I mean our job and our job collectively, that our best days are yet to come. Shabbat shalom.